Welcome to another edition of FHP Lawyers Law Talk. Today it's all about current hot topics. I'm here with Tanvir Gill. Tanvir, how are you? Good, how are you? So I'm also here with Carly Perryman and uh, Car Carly, uh, together with Marvin, runs our immigration department and she's here to talk about all the cool stuff you've read about in the news or listened to on other podcasts. About maybe, about immigration. immigration. Hot topics. So uh, hopefully it's cool enough. For the well, two of I you. hope so. You know, like uh, we've got a lot of energy. We've got good, a good. lot of anticipation here. But I, I think it's fair enough that, uh, boy, you know, there's been we've heard a lot. There's a lot of changes that's happening in the immigration uh, world, and uh, so uh, you know, I, I think uh, this is the this is your chance. Tell us what's going on. Okay, I, I'll start and tell you, although it may change in a week from now. <laughs> well, <laughs> be we'll we'll change to, the, we'll talk about today. Yeah, so there have been a lot of changes significantly to the international student programs, um, to the temporary foreign worker program, and also some, you know, changes that have made it more, I would say, challenging for people to become permanent residents in Canada right now. Okay. And so uh, why don't we start here? You've got the study permit cap you've told me you want to talk about. Yes. So um, what's that all about? So um, it was announced that Canada has significantly cut the amount of international students that are going to be coming to Canada going forward, um, at least over the next three years. Um, so what that means, so 10% reduction for 2025, and then they're going to try and stabilize it, I guess, in 2026, but we'll see what happens. But, but the numbers you've given me are, are to me, they're astonishing. Yeah. I mean, I, I had no idea that there was this many. So, so the cap for 2024 is 485,000 study permits. Yes. And they're only reducing that in 2025 to 437,000. 437,000 yeah. students. I, I just had no. 10% is no not idea. that big. So, I mean, it's a lot of people. But it is a lot of people. When you look at the number itself, the almost yeah. half a million. I think what they've done, though, is they've cut the types of programs that mm. people can come to Canada for. Um, so only focusing really on bachelor and above. Um, so a lot of people that were taking certificate programs or even post-grad programs are, it's going to be more difficult for them to either come here to enroll in that program, but also to be able to then go on to stay in Canada. So, so that, that, that is a legitimate path to permanent residency and citizenship is to come here and, and study. It is, if you are in a bachelor, master, or PhD. And before that, it was just any old certificate? Uh, it wasn't any old certificate, but I think that there was more programs available. Um, Options. That Didn't were non-diploma. program. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, and also, too, there were private institutions that were able to offer programs, which they still can. Um, but through private institution, it's now more difficult to actually get a work permit and achieve that goal of becoming a permanent resident. So, so is there a, a time requirement? Like, does the, the program have to, to be a certain length and, and you have to take so much time during your day to, to be there or something like that? What, what is the criteria? Now? So, so generally, it's a full-time study program. Um, so whatever that looks like at a public institute like, you know, UBC or, mm -hmm. or UVic or, um, you know, any of those publicly funded institutions. Um, and then they have to graduate. So, so be focused on their studies, graduate from the program. And then at that point, they're given, those ones are given the opportunity to be able to work, to get some experience. Um, and then, you know, continue to contribute to Canada uh, and eventually become a permanent resident. Now well, you, the you ones can work though. While, yeah, while I was going to say the ones that are studying, on the currently yeah. they can work. Does that change? That remains the same, but it's program specific too. Mm. So it would have to say on their study permit that they're able to work off campus, and the limit is twenty hours per week. Doing anything? So I, I come here and I'm going to study. I don't know marketing. Mm -hmm. Can I go and get a job at Arby's? You could, but I don't know if that would help you as far as preparing for your permanent residency path. Mm. I see. Because it's not, a, you know, working at RVs is not considered to be a skilled job. So you could definitely do that, and lots of people do, mm -hmm. um, but that's kind of where we come in. So if we're working with ones that are going to school, is we help them to look at the big picture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, how are the choices that you're making now, how is that going to prepare you for your goal to become a permanent resident and eventually a citizen? Okay, so what is this publicly funded? What does that mean? Uh, you know, I think I read on you know one of the local news outlets here that Okanagan College was seeing a, a big decrease, but that's a publicly funded 
institution, isn't it? Yeah, and, and the official language is a designated learning institution, or DLI. Um, so Immigration Canada actually has a database that you can look into to find out if your school or a school that you're thinking of going to is on that list. Mm. Um, Okanagan College is. Um, but like I said, they're just shifting on the types of programs. So because Okanagan College is a college, they Might offer a lot of certificate yeah. programs. Um, they do offer some bachelor programs, but I think that they've probably seen a decrease in enrollment for those certificate programs because, um, you know, obviously there's no pathway for those ones to become, to stay in Canada after they graduate. Okay, so, so, so it has to be a diploma now. Yes. Is that two, does that mean two years? Uh, two, three, four, yeah. Oh boy. Depends on the program. Oh boy, mm -hmm. okay. So that's a big change. It is. So, so when I look at the numbers, when they say a 10% decrease, that doesn't seem like a lot to me. That's a lot of permits they're giving out. It's just that now it's a lot harder to, to get into these, these actual uh, diploma programs. And what happens, if you don't, what happens if you don't pass? What if I get here, I don't even go? Uh, what, what happens then? Then you better come and talk to us. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I mean, there are a lot of different reasons why people might not be able to follow through on their studies. So um, we definitely work with those clients, you know, some that may have had an illness um, or something happens and they just simply can't afford to continue going to school. Or, you know, in other cases, we've had clients who've had a death in the family if it was their father that was paying for their education and he died. So those reasons exist. So at that point, we do help those. And there's things we can do. We can apply um, for a work permit for a destitute student mm -hmm. so that they can work a little while to get back on their feet. But the intention is for them to get back on their feet and then go back to school to finish their program. Now, what happens to the, uh, the, the students that are kind of caught in the middle of this? They've, they've started a certificate program and now the government says, oh, no, you have to go to a special school. Uh, publicly funded school and get a diploma, uh, are they going to be grandfathered in? Uh, so no, they won't be. Um, I think a lot wow. of those students are looking at maybe changing programs. Um, so that's what we will normally do is refer them to a publicly funded school, a DLI, to work with their admissions department to see if any of the schooling that they've taken in their certificate program can be used as credit towards getting into a program that is eligible. Imagine being almost done and all of a sudden you mm -hmm. have to then start again and see if any of that carries over. I know. Yeah, it's difficult. I feel for those ones for sure, but that's what happens. It's the government. <laughs> is, there, is there any... So, so after you, you um, graduate... Uh, what is the next step after that towards your path towards being able to work in, in Canada permanently? So most DLIs are eligible for a postgraduate work permit. Okay, and DLI is an acronym, and just for, yeah. for us, what is Designated that Designated Learning Institution. Okay. So if you graduate from the program that you are enrolled in, then you will be eligible for an open work permit um, up to a maximum of three years, depending on the length of your program. So the intention of that, and you know, we always tell people is make a good decision that your this is your career. Mm -hmm. So that the job that you pick um, it aligns with your career goals. It is skilled work mm -hmm. so that you can use those three years to work towards your permanent residency. And, and at the end of the three years, then what happens? So there's lots of different programs for permanent residency. Um, the most common one for skilled workers is called express entry. Mm -hmm. So it's like it says in the name, it's a fast pathway for those that meet the qualification. So it's on a point system called the comprehensive ranking score. So each person is assigned points based around things like their age, the younger, the better. Actually, anyone over 35 is considered to be old, which Geriatric. is very disappointing, <laughs> right? You get less points. Um, but, you know, your level of education inside Canada and outside of Canada, your English or French language ability, whether or not you have brothers and sisters in Canada. So basically all of those points add up to a number out of 1,200. Is, is it the same same point criteria for those applying outside of Canada as inside Canada after they've graduated? It's a different program. So, okay. so the express entry is the umbrella, mm -hmm. and within that there are categories, I would say. So federal skilled worker category, ones that are outside of Canada can apply, but right now... Canada is not prioritizing ones that are outside. They're looking at people that are already here. Mm -hmm. So those people would qualify under the Canadian experience class subcategory. Mm -hmm. And then there's other sub subcategories for trades as well. 
So, so that three year, uh, can they do anything as long as they've got a job? This is my career now, or or is that is that ranked on that point system? What they're doing? It's it's definitely ranked. So there's something called the National Occupation Classification, the NOC. Lots wow. of acronyms. Um, so that's a data bank where Canada has decided and coded every single job that exists. I mean, I wish I would have had that on career day in high school. <laughs> Maybe I wouldn't yeah. be here. Maybe I'd be somewhere else. Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but yeah, so basically what it does, it assigns a code to the job. Mm -hmm. And then that is ranked in a tier system. So it goes from zero, which is management, all the way down to five, which is low skill. So, so you, you, would, you could help there. Then you would Absolutely. say, look, you've got three years here to, to get a bunch of points. So that's to... what we do. Oh, so okay. that's one of the services that we offer. So we offer a 30-minute video consultation. We get information from the person before the meeting so that we can prepare. We can do their CRS score assessment. We can look at their resume to see what their education is. Um, look at what their career goals are and then give them steps and help them to know which program they should be looking at applying for. Okay. And, I, and, and you give me some crib notes here. You put some stuff down about spouses, I guess. So, ah, yes. So okay. What is that all about? Yeah. So, I mean, th that's a pretty steady program and I, I'm really grateful for that. So with this, the, um, the spousal, up until now, you know, there has been the ability for people to bring their spouses to Canada if they were going to school or working. Um, recently, there's been some changes, which is definitely impacting ones that were planning on bringing their spouse. Um, so if you are an international student, you have to be in a master's program or above wow. to be able to bring your spouse with you and for them to be able to obtain a work permit. That's really that a big change, isn't yeah. it? Because so, so now I've got to be in a two-year diploma program at least and I can't bring my, my spouse. Right. So I think that's, you know, when they're looking at that 10%, I mean, it's going to discourage a lot of people from applying yeah. because they're not going to be able to bring their families with them. I mean, they can, but that means that their spouse is not going to be able to work. What, what about in that three-year period? Once I've got my diploma and I'm in that three-year period where I'm trying to get points, uh, can I bring my spouse over then? So, so again, a lot of changes. So mm -hmm. it has to be in what's considered to be an in-demand occupation. Mm -hmm. So right now, Canada has changed that to a management occupation. So if it's in that tier zero and you're working in that job, then your spouse is eligible for an open work permit. Oh, wow. Yeah, and that's oh. it. So they, they definitely discourage people from coming to school in Canada by, by limiting the spouse's ability to be able to work. And what's like this? you need a cheat sheet to mm -hmm. to sort of lay out all yeah. of that. If this program, these categories, mm -hmm. if one of these, then it depends. Wow. Yeah, that's a lot. That's it a lot a just lot. to keep up with. That's a lot. Yeah, for sure. Well, I, I, it is. I mean, if you're trying to 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 immigrate and get a job here, that's a lot. To, a lot of behind the scenes stuff to know. I mean, it's just not going to happen organically. It sounds like it has to be very strategic. It right? does, and and it kind of shifts all the time, yeah. right? And that's what we always tell people is that yes, we'll help you set these goals, but you know that's something that we're doing is we're back monitoring here. Like, check back in, right? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and it might well. change. So I mean, you set those goals to set yourself up for success, but yeah. something could shift and that program closes. So now you have to reevaluate. Mm -hmm. Wow. Okay. And what's this all this about the cost of living threshold? What does uh, that have? To yeah. So, so basically they have upped, uh, the government has upped the cost of living threshold. So before, if you were coming as an international student, you had to show that you had a certain amount of money to rely available, on. Mm -hmm. right? So your tuition was paid, um, but that you also had money in the bank that you could pull out at any time if you needed. Um, they've upped that number significantly. I mean, the cost of living here has gone up. We all know. Yeah. Um, what do you generally need to show that you have available to you? You know, it really depends um, on number one for a single person. And I actually don't know that right off the top of my head, but they have a chart. So they'll say, okay, if you're a single person, it's this much. It was 10,000. I think it's more than that now. If you're a family of two, it's this much, right? So, and it just kind of goes up from there. Huh. Okay. So very, very much harder, it sounds like, yeah. with these changes Absolutely. to... Uh, to come here using that route to get into Canada. Yeah. It sounds like you've really got to really got to want to be here and uh, for the, the long term. And be prepared. I think that's kind of the goal because, you know, people keep saying to us, you know, is this going to affect your workload? No, not at all. I mean, t typically we don't see a lot of students 
applications. Those are usually handled by the schools and immigration consultants. Um, but I think what we did see was a lot of people where things had gone terribly wrong. And then all of a sudden they needed our help because they couldn't afford to eat <laughs> and pay their tuition. Um, you know, things like that. So these changes, I think, is going to help people to be more prepared to come to Canada. So they've got enough money in the bank. You know, they've, they're they getting the English language skills that they need to be able to survive here. Because I think that, the you know, the failure rate of, of a lot of the people that we saw coming w was too much. Okay. Anything else you want to talk about with uh, respect to the the new, the changes to, to the, the, uh, um, the students? Um, I would just say, I mean, we always say, you know, talk to a professional. Um, you know, even if you don't end up hiring someone to take you through that whole process, at least having someone that you can talk to even for one hour to kind of get an understanding of where you where the person fits. And, and, and you guys do that? We do that. Absolutely. So like I said, we'll offer that 30 minute um, plan, you know, depending on the complexity. Um, but if it's just to answer general questions or to kind of create a plan, we can do that. Um, and then also the other advice I would have for students is that they should look at in-demand occupations that are going to bring significant benefit to Canada. Yeah. So, so look at that, right? Th that's available. And Canada has a plan. So if you want to come to Canada and use your skills, then you need to be a part of that plan. It's just the old, the old saying, you know, it's, uh, it's cheaper to see a lawyer in the beginning of things and instead of seeing one at the end when, oh, when absolutely. things go badly. So do, do people believe that, though? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> we certainly <get> <laughs> <laughs> do get both sides. Yeah. Jeez, but, mm -hmm. uh, okay, and, and so I guess the other big thing that's going on right now is the temporary forward workers. And, uh, yes. you know, we're hearing a lot about that in, in the news and how, how things have changed. And uh, so yeah. what's going on there? What do we need to know? Well, before the pandemic, um, the, the program was basically the same as the changes that they've made now. Ah. Um, so what happened during the pandemic is that because all of a sudden everybody was sent home, the unemployment rate was high, but also there was a lot of labor shortages. So they basically eliminated some of the restrictions and just opened it up so that Canada could fill those positions that were needed. Um, and it worked. And I think, you know, it kind of worked too well. So now they've scaled back and said, we're going to go back to how things were before the pandemic. So basically what that means is if the uh, region that you live in has an unemployment rate of over 6%, in a metropolitan area like us, like Vancouver, then they will refuse to process um, application, which is called a labor market impact assessment for a Canadian employer for what's considered to be a low skill position. So the other one is there's increased scrutiny on the Canadian company's ability to fulfill the terms of the employment contract. So, you know, every employee Canadian or not is subject to, you know, the Employment Standards Act. Mm -hmm. um, but especially for temporary form workers, the company has to be able to show that they're able to pay the wage. It, it's financial. Um, so before companies could submit um, what was called an attestation letter. So it was a letter from a lawyer or from an accountant to say that the company had the ability to pay for this employee. Those are no longer acceptable. The company actually has to show it. They have to prove it. Yeah. So they have to show their financial records their, you know, CRA tax returns to be able to show that, you know, which can be a challenge because mm -hmm. for some companies, um, you know, they're being run so that they're not making a profit, right? So all that money is going out to, you know, shareholder dividends and those mm -hmm. kind of things. So, so that's something that we do with uh, Canadian employers is we can review those records to make sure that they're able to show that they can cover the Oh, so salary. there's got to be some some planning now. So you got to show some income yeah. exactly. before before you bring in a worker now, exactly. eh? So okay, that's interesting. So uh, that's gonna that's gonna really restrict the, the program, isn't it? So. I think so. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think that's it. They're just you know trying to make sure that the Canadian companies are you know like I said before, they're going to be taking care of those workers and making sure that they're paid the same as a Canadian would be. Is is there a path to to um, citizenship uh, if you come in as a temporary foreign worker or is it truly temporary? Um, it depends. So there's another subsection of the temporary foreign worker program that's for high skill. Mm. And then there's another one for what's called um, pathway to permanent residency. Um, so for those positions, the criteria is a bit different, um, but they're usually in higher skill positions um, with higher wages. 
And then initially they'll come on on a labor market impact assessment, but they're going to be offered a work permit that's two or three years in length, which then is going to allow them to attain that goal of becoming a permanent resident during those two to three years. Okay. Wow. Oh, that's interesting tough. stuff. There's there's so, so many ways to look at all the changes. I know um, with the LMI process, I hadn't known too much about it. We've, we've had clients that maybe have had it in the past and used it to hire employees. But a lot of what I was hearing recently was that Canadian employers were charging people to have them come in through the LMI process. And this was like 40 60,000 Canadian per worker. The workers were just paying the companies that sum of money to just come here on the LMI and work. Yes, and that bothers me. Yeah. <laughs> I get heated about that. Yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that Marvin and I, you know, we always counsel people on if they're thinking of coming to Canada is that make sure that whoever you work with is reputable. Um, and that goes for not only your immigration representative, but also working with any sort of recruiters because immigration fr fraud is rampant. Yeah. Um, so under the Canadian law, an employer or a recruiter or an immigration professional is not allowed to charge the employee for certain costs related to them becoming a temporary form worker. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think it's a big issue. And then, yeah, people get ripped off. And the job is not what they thought it would be. So I think Canada's trying to monitor that. I mean, I don't know how, I think yeah. it's a big problem. I don't know how you get a hold of it. Um, but we definitely work with our clients to make sure that they're adhering to the laws that, you know, ESDC and Service Canada and the LMI people have put in place. Do you have a sense, like, uh, you know, I, I'm still shocked at the number of uh, study uh, permits that were issued. I mean, 485,000 study permits. Do you have a sense of how many temporary foreign workers are in Canada at any given time? I did not write that down. Uh, we can yeah. Google it. <laughs> so Canada has a five-year plan. Okay. Um, and it, you know, it is made public. So I don't have that off the top of my head. I'm sure the number is still quite large. Um, they've reduced the rates for the low skill occupation they have not reduced the rates for the high skill. Those are in fact increasing because those are the, the places that Canada wants to fill those positions for you know, skilled trades, engineers, people working in tech. So that is gonna continue to increase as well as the, the numbers for permanent residency, those are also increasing. Actually, I see you've, you've written some down here. Are those, are those the, so you've written down healthcare and trade you've highlighted. So that's the, those are the areas? Yeah, so Canada has set targets for people to become permanent residents. Um, so they're going to be basically cutting, <laughs> it's so confusing. So they're cutting the targets for permanent residency overall by 20% broadly, but they're allocating what they're calling economic priorities. So ones that have a French language proficiency and want to live outside of Quebec, that's one. Healthcare occupations is another one because we have a huge shortage. And then the last one is uh, trade occupations. So for 2025, those are the three that are going to be, um, they're going to be focusing on to attain permanent residency. Uh, you know, I, and I, I don't understand the, the French language proficiency outside, outside of, yeah. outside of <laughs> Quebec. Uh, so, so hey, you there... can read the opposite side of a bottle just in case you <laughs> pick it up the other <laughs> way. Like, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, just, it just seems that it's not going, you know, in Kelowna where, where we're, we're filming this, mm -hmm. um, it'd be pretty tough to, to get by without, with just French mm -hmm. and no English. Um, yeah. That doesn't matter. You're it not doesn't. A, it doesn't not. matter. I think they're just encouraging, you know, Canada to maintain the French heritage mm -hmm. outside of Quebec. Um, so yeah. So I mean, if you speak French, <laughs> now's a good time. Now's a good time to come to Canada. But 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 outside of Quebec. Outside of Quebec, for yeah, sure. Yeah, isn't that an interesting? Mm -hmm. criteria? Very interesting. Very very interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay, and uh, healthcare, I guess, you know, we, we certainly hear about a lot of uh, shortages about shortages in that, for, sure. for yeah. sure. And trade occupations, you know, I don't know. Uh, I, you know, uh, uh, it'll be interesting to see as the, the uh, temporary foreign workers kind of, that, that programs and if, if what happens in there, for sure. Yeah, so, uh, well, and I think the trade occupations, you know, it's most of those ones that are considered to be high skill. Yeah. I mean, I think it's going to be difficult for people that are just labor, like a general laborer. Mm -hmm. That's a challenge. But obviously, you know, electricians or 
iron workers or, you know, even roofers. You know, there's a lot of things that we need and Canada is still continuing to grow. Um, and there's just not enough. Yeah. Wow. All right. So, uh, t so what, did, what, what, what kind of are some of the takeaways that you can give us? What kind of uh, advice can you give to people that are looking to, for a pathway, I guess, mm -hmm. to work in Canada? Maybe let's start with students. What would students? you say for students? Sure. Um, so research your school thoroughly. Um, don't be taken in by, um, you know, these recruitment organizations in your home country. Um, make sure that you go right to the source, which is the Immigration Canada website, to make sure that the school that you're going to attend is on the Designated Learning Institute list. Also look at whether or not it qualifies you for a post-grad work permit, mm -hmm. because if you can't get the work permit, then you're going home. Wow, okay. Yeah, that's pretty tough, eh? You know, you're in, in another country, you might not have the language skills, and, you know, how, how, how do you know? You know, I could see it with, where there could be some people taking advantage of, of for sure people. and that's one other thing that i didn't mention is that they've also ra raised the language the bar for english and french language mm -hmm. so for an international student it's much higher than it used to be which i think is a good thing um but yeah i think you know if you are going to come to canada at all start learning english or french how, how do they what do they test do they test before you come to Canada or once yeah. you're here? The so as language a proficiency exam. Exactly. So there's certain tests for English and uh, French. The school has a version of that test that is the academic version. So they will require that that be passed before. And I think immigration regulates what that looks like as well. Um, and then also there is the general version of those tests that work into the permanent residency plans and those are mandatory and it depends on the skill level of the job as to what that test score has to be. Hmm. All right. And uh, what about for workers? What, what's, what's your takeaways? Um, learn French. Learn, fr <laughs> learn French. There yeah, you go. I was going to say that. That's perfect. Yeah. Uh, and, and English. Right. Um, French or English. And also for those ones is that make sure that the career or the job they're coming to in Canada aligns with what their experience is in that occupation. So you can't come to Canada to be a cook um, if you were a framer <laughs> in your home country, right? because the employer has to be able to show that you're the best person for the job. I see. All right. And, and what about what are you what, what's your takeaways for Canadian employers then? All right. So, so Marvin, when I said to Marvin that I was coming on here, hit, what he said is he said, do not hire foreign workers for cash or under the table. Um, there's two reasons for that. Number one, it's illegal. So for the Canadian employer, they can suf suffer fines um, if they were to f be found to have those ones on their job site or at their place of employment. And also it does... It, it ends in consequences for the temporary form worker. And I think that's the saddest thing that we see, that if a temporary form worker has worked under the table with no status, that it's going to eliminate their chances of being able to work legally in Canada in the future. So as an employer, paying someone under the table that doesn't have a work permit, you're not actually doing that person any favors. All right, anything else that uh, you wanna give some, uh, some takeaways or some advice on? Um, Hire a professional, at least consult with a professional. Um, I think, you know, even from our chat today, you can see that there's just so many changes happening all the time. And we don't even know when the new changes are going to come in. We might get day's notice and then all of a sudden we've got something else new to research. Um, so I think if you're, you know, a Canadian employer looking at hiring someone or you're if a person that's already in Canada or thinking of coming to Canada, just having that meeting with someone that knows what they're talking about just so that you can get a sense of what your plan is going to be. And then, you know, obviously with any sort of government, um, it ha your application has to be perfect. Um, so that, you know, no one's perfect, but we strive for that. Um, we have a great team here um, where we do, you know, we have a lot of expertise and we kind of do this kind of layers of checking to make sure that we've done everything as good as we can to make sure that we get the outcome that we want. I, I just, I, I, the, the numbers are so high. It just seems like if you were working in the immigration department, there's going to be this huge lag anyway, you know. I, I, uh, Slow process. Is it, uh, do you find that it's really 
really um, laggy? Or? It can be. I mean, I think right now it is, but there's certain things that we can do to help people in those positions. And I think a lot of, it's about timing. Mm -hmm. um, well, so, just thinking if your, your application isn't perfect, mm -hmm. then you've got to resubmit it and go through that crazy yeah. Exactly. And that's what we don't, again. that's what we don't want. Yeah. yeah. So we want to set people up for success. And um, yeah, there's a lot of waiting. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, hopefully, you know, we can, we can be there for you and just kind of help, help with patients because, you know, we've had to develop a lot of it. All right. Do you want to sign off today? Sure. All right. Thanks, Carly. That was great. I think there's just so much to this. And oh my, I think we could have gone on for another hour. Or so with all the complexities, all the categories, all the different options that are out there for people that are coming in as students, as temporary workers, as employers, there's just so much of it. As usual, it's such an aerial like overview conversation. Um, if you are an employer, if you have certain questions about your own application, reach out to us, let us know. Um, and Wait, that, was, you, that was better than... What do you usually that, say? I, well, well, you next know what? I don't. Time. I don't think I actually have it. You do have off. a saying. That was pretty good. Usually by the end, I like. I've lost zone my out, my uh, there's end a saying. job here. <laughs> Until next time, that's what you say. <laughs> Until next time, <laughs> that's right. Thanks.